Hi readers, me here, and today I'm going to be doing my first real installment in the Women in War series. Ultimately, by the end of the year, I'd like to be able to incorporate um, <clears throat> media, pictures, maybe some music or movies into this, but I am not there technolo technologically right yet. So, um, I really was going to wait another day before I did this, but one thing I've learned about myself is don't wait, just do it. This might be a little bit of a mess, so bear with me. When I talked about this video, I thought that I was going to read The Rose Code and Women Intelligence and then talk about a figure from them. Um, and I did-ish, however... I was not able to f finish Women in, Intel in Intelligence because of the writing style and some issues that I had with it. That is neither here nor there. I am using it as a reference for this video and for other videos. But what the Rose Code did lead me to was this. The Road to Station X... <clears throat> by Sarah Baring. The full title is The Road to Station X from Debutante Ball, Ball to Fighter Plane Factory to Bletchley Park, a memoir of one woman's journey through World War II. Now I saw a review of this book from some library and it says that um, the war changed the course of Sarah Baring's life. It did not. Sarah Baring was a socialite and before the war, and she was a socialite after the war. She was also a memoirist, memoirist. And that is not to downplay or denigrate her at all. She was what she was. If it had changed her life entirely, she would have been something else after. I do believe that it changed her feelings about life and her experience of life. Um, and she talks about it in here. And again, bear with me getting my notes together. <clears throat> um, first of all, I loved both of these books, The Rose Code and um, the Sarah Baring book. I loved Sarah Baring's voice. It is very socialite and she was very, very young when the war started. In her, I think when it ended, she was 25. So, she spent her early 20s and late teens involved in this, and that's reflected in her memories. Um, my experiences back in Afghanistan in my early 30s are probably different than they would be now. Um, so, pre-Britain's involvement in the war, this is my favorite thing, her parents sent her to Germany to learn the language. And that ended up opening doors for her down the road after the war started. But she got sent home in disre disrepute after she and her friends got caught ripping down an anti-Jewish newspaper called Die Juden that, since no one would actually buy the newspaper, the Nazis decided that they would display it prominently so everybody could see it, and they enclosed it in glass, and she and her friends went around breaking the glass and ripping it down. Eventually, they got caught, and um, she got sent back. And her mom's response was, um, Well done. Despite your nuisance value, I hope you learned the language. And it, it looks like she did. Um, once, the air, the, once the war started, everybody had to get involved in some way or another. Even Sarah's mother worked, and I felt like that felt a little bit rare for socialites. I'm not sure what a socialite actually does. Um, she, her first, Sarah's first job was at an air raid precaution center. I'm not sure what that entails. I read it. I forgot it. Um, but one night the army contacted them because they had a jet down German pilot. And they were looking for a linguist. Sarah, of course, spoke German. Um, and this is her memory of him. Because she had a hatred for the Nazis, but she'd never 
I think, come across a German soldier like this. She had seen Hitler and Goebbels and Goering, and she talks about him in the book. But when she sees the pilot, she says, There, crouched in the corner of an old army drill hall, was an ashen-faced, shivering young boy. He could not have been much older than me. The shock stunned me into silence, and I found that I could not hate him, but no way was I going to like him. Apparently, the Air Raid Precaution Center wasn't enough for Sarah, and it might be because of money, because they talk a lot about how little the women were paid in each of these jobs. But after that, she went into manufacturing, and um, again, they talk about money and how the plant didn't provide any PPE, personal prote protective equipment, so they either had it because they had it, or they didn't have it at all. Um, when I was growing up and learning about World War II and women in the workforce, there's a large, there was a large amount of information about Rosie the Riveter and women in industry. And I looked in a North Carolina history book, same thing. Very small paragraph about women in the, um, in the WAC, I can't remember what the acronym sta stands for. Um, and in another Smithsonian World War II guide, again, all about industry, all about manufacturing, very little about intelligence. And uh, that's why I'd hoped Helen Fry's book was going to be easier, an easier read. So. She does the manufacturing for a while. Then she and her friend, Osla, who is also featured in the Rose Code, were recruited because it was, they knew someone who knew someone, and they were recruited to be linguists at, for Station X at Bletchley Park. If you don't know, Bletchley Park was a famous code-breaking center for the British in World War II. Um, Sorry for the pauses. I'll get better at this. Anywho, they recruit. They get recruited. They take a language test. They pass, and they start um, collating intelligence in Hut Four using index cards. I'm going to read here for a second from Helen Fry's book, Women in Intelligence, but it's also in Sarah's book. She recalled how the index cards were kept in long boxes, like an elongated shoe box. Each time a signal came in and was translated, you had to put down the salient points in that signal, such as the name of the U-boat commander on one card, the number of the U-boat on another. Um, anything related to that signal went on different cards. Um, Sarah also talks about how she's very critical of the admirals who didn't want to use their intelligence because they couldn't tell them where it came from, which seems legit. Um, the last thing that I really got out of this story was something that I could really relate to. Um, and it is about the end of the war. She talks about how you know, it was a surprise to um, to her, and I'm looking for my, I am looking for my comment on this. Um, at the very end of the book, she states, it took us a long time to realize peace had come at last. I left Naval Intelligence and NID 12A in tears. Bletchley, thanks for the memory. So you can read this memoir on Kindle Unlimited. It is free. It's a really interesting view into Bletchley Park and one woman's experience of it. Um, what I want to do is use this series to highlight the different ways outside of manufacturing that women participated in the war. Now, Sarah Baring did not have a combat role. She wasn't out on the front lines 
taking people over the Pyrenees or anything like that. However, intelligence collection is extremely important. And, you know, you want to talk about operators and, and shooters. Well, you can't operate and you can't shoot unless you have good intelligence collected and translated um, accurately. So, thank you for bear bearing with me on this first Women in War episode. I know it's been a bit of a mess. I will get better at it. Next month, I it may go into March because February is a short month, but next month I'm going to do a deep dive, for real this time, into Mildred Fish Harnack. Harnack. I don't know why I have such trouble pronouncing her last name. Um, Mildred was a woman from Wisconsin who was a leader in the German resistance. Her husband was German, and she ended up on Hitler's orders being executed after she was caught for in her activities. So, that's all for me. Happy reading. Thanks for bearing with me.